This week, the Masters field features 91 players from 20 countries, including six amateurs who are among 19 first-time participants. With more patrons in attendance, we will be able to resume traditions that were missed during the past two tournaments. Today, the Par 3 contest returns to the schedule. We appreciate the overwhelming support of this event, which showcases some of golf's greatest attributes, friendship, fellowship, and fun. This year marks two important milestones in Masters history. 85 years ago, Byron Nelson claimed his first Masters victory, gaining six strokes at Amen Corner. This remarkable feat is commemorated by the Nelson Bridge at the 13th tee. And 25 years ago, Tiger Woods delivered one of the most dominant performances in Masters history to win his first of five green jackets, breaking 20 tournament records and tying six more Tiger drew new audiences into the game and inspired generations of players as he continues to do today. Tiger's appearance this week is a tribute to his amazing determination and his commitment to excellence as a competitor and as a person. We wish him well this week and in the future and join the world of golf and millions of fans in congratulation, congratulating him on his induction last month into the World Golf Hall of Fame. On the subject of those with celebrated Masters histories, I would like to pay tribute to two true gentlemen no longer with us, but whose legacies always will be honored here. In January, we lost 1968 Masters champion Bob Golby. Bob had a passion for golf and a love for the Masters that were evident each time he put on his green jacket. His presence was missed last night at the Champions Dinner, but we always will remember him, not only his triumph here, but also his sportsmanship, his humility, and most importantly, his friendship. In November, we also lost one of great golf's greatest pioneers, Lee Elder. A year ago, we honored the, the important trail Lee blazed as the first black man to compete in the Masters. It was a moment we will treasure forever. Lee exemplified talent, determination, and selfless commitment to paving the way for others. His impact is, is ingrained in Masters history and will be honored in Augusta for years to come through the Lee Elder Scholarships at Payne College. Since announcing that Augusta National would fund the creation of a women's golf team, as well as a men's and women's golf scholarship in Lee's name, we have worked closely with Payne College to bring these initiatives to fruition. I'm pleased to have members of the Payne College leadership with us today, and I am proud to welcome the inaugural Lee Elder Scholars, Taya Buxton and Devin Smith. I know this would have been a proud moment for Lee. Taya, Devin, please stand so we can recognize you. Congratulations. Finally, tomorrow morning, we will begin the 86 Masters by welcoming two-time Masters champion Tom Watson to the honorary starters tradition. Tom will join his fellow champions and good friends, Jack Nicklaus, and Gary Player on the first tee. This will be a fitting celebration of Tom's role in Masters history and as one of the game's greats over the past half century. We look forward to sharing this special occasion with all of you, as well as our patrons and Tom's fans worldwide. I'd like to thank you again for being with us. We appreciate the way you tell the story of the Masters to the world. Tom, I'm ready to take a few questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're ready to open up for questions at this time. Please remember to speak directly into the microphone. Questions? Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Chairman Ridley, the role that Augusta National Golf Club played to help the city of Augusta during the pandemic cannot be overstated. My question is, 
What lessons did you learn from your partnership with this community during that time, especially the medical community? And how might those lessons help the club and this area going forward? Well, I would say that working with the Augusta community has always been very important to us. Um, uh, contributing to community is part of our mission statement, and it actually is on a green card that many of our employees carry around with them or display in their workspaces. Um, we've been involved with the community for many years, primarily through the Community Foundation. I would say more recently, uh, our efforts would be, perhaps you would say, more intentional and more project-focused. Um, I think our involvement with the community through the pandemic really highlighted to me the many good people and many organizations in this community that, that really have a, a sincere interest and a, and a concern for the welfare of the community. Um, the other thing that uh, really struck me was uh, the wonderful employees and partners we have. You know, our, our employees, almost to a person, uh, care, they care deeply about this community, and many have volunteered uh, their own time. And we recently have uh, instituted a, an organizational program where we encourage people and give them time off from work to volunteer. And then our partners have, have just jumped in in a big way, in, in ways that I've reported in the past, and they're looking as we are to do more. Uh, so I think really the, the entire experience, while it was, it was certainly difficult, um, but working with AU Health, uh, the uh, vaccination centers that we work together with them, the, the mobile vaccination units that our partner Mercedes-Benz helped with, it was really a joint effort. And uh, I'm proud of the way that, that we work together, and I'm very proud of Augusta. Thank you. Jeff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, you detailed just a little bit there on the golf course changes. The players have, have shared a lot of other things that they have seen. Um, can you tell us what you're most interested in seeing play out this week in terms of uh, those changes and, and maybe what you're looking for and, and how it impacts uh, the tournament? Well, as I've said before and as I commented in my remarks, um, we're always we're always looking uh, every year how we can improve the golf course. You know, I, I'm I'm very committed to the objectives and, and design philosophies of our founder, co-founder Bobby Jones and, and Dr. McKinsey. Um, you know, Jones said many times that he wanted to create an inland links course, which is is almost perhaps an oxymoron. But I think what he meant by that was that he wanted to have uh, firm and fast conditions uh, throughout the golf course. So, so the ground became a factor in the play of the golf course and the, the shots and the options that the players had. Um, the other thing uh, that, that he, was, he emphasized was the importance of the approach shots to the, to, the, to the hole, to the green, and the fact that there were many options to that, but that certain options were going to create better approaches and so we wanted to, to try to, to incorporate those concepts into the golf course uh, as we think about making changes. Uh, this year, um, one of the things that uh, you may have noticed is that uh, several of the fairways, the fairway quarters have been widened. Perhaps there's a little less second cut. Um, you know, my thinking on that is, is that a shot that's offline uh, may run a bit further and may run into an area where a player might not want to be. Uh, speaking specifically about the changes this year, we, we did regrass three greens, which is our normal procedure. Uh, we, we redid number three, number 13, and, and number 17. Um, you know, not any major changes there. I think we, we hopefully tried to, um, uh, to gain another hole location or two on each one of those greens. Uh, but the, the, real, the real major project this year was at 11 and 15. And those two, those two holes really, they had to go together because in lengthening the 15th tee, the only way we could do that was to, was to change the grade on 11. Otherwise, we'd have had to build a retaining wall to move the tee back on, on 15, and we really didn't want to do that. So we lowered the 11th tee uh, three or four feet and then we actually brought the members tee on 11, lowered the 15th tee three or four feet, brought the members tee on 11 up four or five feet, which made that slope a lot, a lot more gentle. In the fairway, we obviously removed many trees. Um, 
uh, we, then, we then put three new trees further downrange that, uh, while they don't necessarily block a shot, they certainly create some issues. Uh, one of the players, I forget who it was in an interview yesterday, initially said, uh, well, there's a bailout area on the right. And then later in his comments, he said, well, there's not really a bailout area because if you're over there, you've got a really hard shot, but you can make a birdie. And so that's really what we were trying to, trying to incorporate the risk-reward element into, into some of these changes we made. Alex. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, obviously Phil Mickelson isn't here this week. Um, when it was announced that he wasn't going to be at the Masters, there's a lot of speculation if you actually disinvited him. Could you confirm what exactly happened with Phil Mickelson? Well, first, I, I would like to say we did not disinvite Phil. Uh, Phil is a three-time Masters champion and, and is invited, uh, you know, in, in that category and many other categories. He's the defending PGA champion. Um, um, Phil uh, reached out to me, uh, I think it was in late February, early March, uh, and, and let me know that he uh, did not intend to play. Um, we uh, that that was uh, by way of a text, and I thanked him for the, his courtesy and letting me know. Uh, told him that um, we uh, we certainly appreciated that, and uh, um, you know told him that um, you know I, I was certainly willing to you know discuss that further with him if he'd like, and he thanked me, and we had a very cordial exchange. Christine. Thank you, Tom. Fred, good to see you. Um, as you, are, I'm sure, are well aware, uh, August will be the 10th anniversary of Augusta National announcing it would have women members. And I'm sure you're aware also, in June, it will be the 50th anniversary of Title IX, the law that changed the playing fields of America for girls and women, including your daughters. Uh, with that in mind, and the fact that Augusta, you know, with you in, in charge, has been catching up quite a bit from that 50-year to 10-year gap, um, not sure that's apples and oranges, uh, probably it is apples and oranges, but still, um, are, are two questions. Would you be willing to tell us the number of women members you have here, <laughs> giving it the old college try? And number two, uh, are you satisfied with the progress over these past 10 years with women members and the other things you're doing? Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Um, well, as you probably uh, would anticipate, uh, I'm not going to comment on any issue relating to membership. We have, uh, we have a number of women members who we are delighted are part of our organization. Um, um, I think you know certainly who some of them are. Um, uh, we, you know, they have been great contributors to our organization, uh, both, uh, I would say, substantively in things that they're doing to help us, uh, both with the masters and otherwise. But I think more importantly, um, they, they, our culture is better. And, and, um, I, I'm, I'm confident in saying, you know, to a person, we, we're a better club, we're a better organization, um, and uh, we're very proud to have women among our member membership. You know, it, it, when I think back when this happened, it seems like it was, in some respects, only yesterday. Um, and, you know, I think, in look, looking back, we, we obviously are, look at that as a very positive uh, thing that happened at Augusta National, and um, I don't know about you, but you know, when, when anything happens or any idea you have that turns out well and you're pleased about it, um, initiative, whatever, you, you might always say, "Well, why didn't we do that sooner?" And uh, that, that's a fair that's a fair thought. And so I wish I wish we had it, but the fact remains that our women members are a very important part of our membership. And uh, you will continue to see over the years, if you look, more green jackets that are women. I'm going to make sure of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back to the course changes, Fred. Is there any comment or any timetable for number 13, which you've mentioned has lost its risk-reward character? Yeah, I mean, I, no, there's no, there's no timetable, nothing to announce at this time. Um, that's something that certainly we have considered and will continue to consider. Um, you know, admittedly, and I've said this before, um, the 13th hole, 
it does not have the same uh, challenges that it, that it has historically. Um, and uh, I mean, I can just remember, you know, as a young guy watching the Masters, you know, some of the triumphs and tragedies. And while we still have those, um, you know, the fact that players are hitting middle to short irons into that hole, um, you know, is not really how it was designed. You know, having said that, you know, my, my reluctance uh, to date has been that it's, it's a, such an iconic hole. And uh, probably along with 11, uh, 12 rather, and uh, maybe 15, I mean, probably the three holes where the most history has been made at Augusta National. So um, that's probably, you know, it has been sort of a counter, you know, a counter uh, to, to doing anything. But, I mean, at some point in time, uh, you know, it's something that, we likely will do. We just don't have anything to, to say about it right now. Alan? At least one um, menu item we've heard about was apparently not available because of supply chain issues this year. I'm wondering <clears throat> what other supply chain issues you all encountered and also how inflation entered into your concession pricing calculations for this year? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean we, we have encountered supply chain issues just like everyone in everything we've done. I mean, it, it's, you know, uh, you know, the construction projects we undertook this past year and the ones that we plan for the upcoming year, which I'll tell you about next April. Um, you know, it's really just a matter of planning, uh, more planning, advanced planning, and, and, and fortunately we've been able to manage that. Um, as it relates to inflation, um, you know, I think – uh, we have had some modest price increases. I think that most, if not everyone, would say that there's great value in our concessions. And so uh, we're very comfortable with that. Bob. Thank you, Fred. Um, continuing on from the question about Phil, it's somewhat related, obviously, the, the idea of these rival golf leagues that have come up here in the last couple of years. Um, what is your stance on that? Could, have you spoken to any players about their possible involvement in those leagues? Would you be opposed to that? And it could, could it even preclude them from being invited here if they were to, to go down that road? Well, I guess I would start, Bob, by saying that, that our mission is always to act in the best interest of the game in whatever form that may take. Um, I think that uh, I think the golf's in a, in, a good, in a good place right now. Um, there's more participation. Uh, purses on the professional tours are the highest they've ever been. Uh, you know, clubs and courses, uh, I think, are in healthy financial positions. Um, you, know, you know, the youth uh, that are emerging at a competitive level is just amazing. I mean, the top four players in the world are under 30. I think t seven of the top ten are under 30. So, um, you know, we've been... You know, we've been uh, pretty clear and, uh, you know, in our, in our belief that the, that the, that the, the, the world tours uh, have done a great job in promoting the game over the years. Um, you know, I, beyond that, you know, there's, there's so much that we don't know about what might happen or could happen that I just don't think, Bob, I can say much more beyond that. Ann. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Can you comment further on the, just the surprising turn of events in the last couple months, the fact that Tiger is actually playing and Phil is not here? Well, certainly not anything we, we anticipated. Um, I think, um, you know, in, in, in Phil's case, I mean, he made a, a personal decision. And, uh, you know, I don't really have, I don't know anything beyond that as to, um, you know, I, I know that, um, um, you know, Phil, um, Phil has been a real fixture here at the Masters for many, many years. He's been a big part of our history. And, uh, you know, I certainly and we certainly wish him the best sort of working through the issues he's dealing with right now. Um, as it relates to Tiger, I mean, I, it's, it's just truly amazing. I mean, I, I don't even know how else to say it. I, you know, I would have, you know, probably taken some pretty high odds, you know, a few weeks or you know, a few months ago, even a few weeks ago, that he, whether or not he would be here. But, you know, when you think about it, it really shouldn't surprise us. 
I mean, he is one of the most determined, dedicated athletes I think that I have ever seen in my life. So um, I saw him last Tuesday when he was up practicing. He was in great spirits. You know, I had Charlie with him. Um, and, uh, you know, it was interesting yesterday in his press conference, he, he said the only really issue is, is walking, that his, his golf swing's fine. And so who knows what might happen this week. But we're excited he's here. Gabriel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for chatting with us today. Um, you mentioned uh, the whole thing with uh, the partnership with Payne College, uh, the Lee Elder Scholarship, uh, and even the creation of the women's team there. Uh, how, how did that partnership come about, and how gratifying is it for you today to see Ty and Devin as kind of the first fruits of that whole deal? Well, I'm, I'm really, really proud to see him and here and happy for them and, and for Payne College. Um, you know, I think it goes back. Um, it, it goes back to the, the sort of the, the events of 2020, and um, and the fact that we um, we really wanted to do something to to help our community, and that sort of manifested itself in a couple of ways. I mean, you've heard about this wonderful facility that you saw on the screen, uh, the hub in downtown Augusta, and then. You know, we knew we knew of Lee's um, longtime affiliation and, and affection for Payne College, and 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 that just was a was a great sort of convergence of such uh, of a situation where Lee was going to be here. We had decided we were going to honor him, having be one of our honorary starters, and and we knew how much Payne College meant to him, and it was particularly gratifying for me because. You know, I met, I met Lee in 1977. We were both playing in the Masters. We actually played a practice round together. And so um, it was a special time for all of us that that, that came together. And, and um, you know, we, we certainly miss Lee. Uh, he, you know, he was a man of, of such grace. Um, I really respect him. Good one. Thank you. All right, sorry, just come back to the, the 13th hole, if I may. What do you think will, will happen first, that, that you will have to make changes to the whole or the governing bodies will make changes to the legislation that means you don't have to? Well, we won't know for some time because there's a, there's a uh, sort of a process that sort of all, everyone's agreed to as to how any changes, equipment changes such as this are going to take place. Um, so it wouldn't, we really can't make any predictions as to what's going to happen. But I think, you know, I think if there, if there are some, some marginal modifications to the equipment rules, from what I have observed over the past few years with these players and their athleticism, their strength, their size, you know, their, the, you know, the efficiency of their golf swings, I don't think that we're going to see courses being shortened. So um, perhaps the two sort of factors might converge, but um, I don't think that what the governing bodies do is going to have a direct impact on what we might do with 13 or any other hole in the golf course. That's sorry, just to follow up, is that because you, you don't think that basically the changes will be drastic enough? Is that the point? I don't know what the changes are going to be, um, but, but what I'm saying is, is that um, I, I think, you know, I think the, the likelihood of you know, of a ball going 50 yards shorter is not not very great. And my point is, I mean, it's we don't really know where it might come out. Uh, there's going to be a process. There's going to be a lot of a lot of input from constitu constituencies. Um, but I think, regardless of that, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go forward on our own time timetable and make changes we think to. Uh, most of our tees are 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 pretty lengthy. So we have a lot of optionality today, and we'll continue to have that optionality going forward. We have just a couple more questions. Uh, Mike. Thank you, Tom. Could you uh, bring up Bob Jones's name from time to time? He's, he hasn't been here in over half a century. If you could just drop in here today and see what's become of the course and the tournament, what do you think he'd think? Well, I hope he'd be proud. You know, I hope that he would feel that um, – you know, we continue to uh, carry the tradition and values that he thought were so important in the game. Um, I think he would be amazed. 
at uh, you know if you look at um, if you look at old pictures of this place, um, the course routing is pretty much the same, but uh, you know not a lot else is is the same. I think so. I think he would be. I think he would really uh, be surprised, be amazed, but I think I think he would be pleased. Um, he, he certainly would know uh, after speaking with just a few of us that he continues to be revered and uh, his persona really drives a lot of what we do here. Uh, last question, Richard. Thanks, Tom. Mr. Chairman, I think this goes back to growing the game. Uh, Masters prep for many of us this year involved watching a viral video of some guys playing amen corner in a way we have never seen before. We assume they had permission to do that. Will you just walk us through the request, your initial reaction, and what you think of the video? Okay. You're referring, <laughs> you're referring to the dude perfect guys, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, the, well, my first reaction was, is, who are these guys? You know, I never heard of them. But, um, but no, it, it uh, Richard, it, it goes, it really, um, it was something that I got comfortable with very quickly. Uh, number one, um, you know, these are very upstanding young men who, um, uh, who it, it was obvious to me in some discussions, some third party discussions of people who had been dealing with them, and then some things they said actually on you know, on video, um, you know, the, the, they they had the utmost respect and reverence for Augusta National. And so, um, you know, it was really part of our continuing effort to be relevant, you know, to different age groups. And, um, you know, I understand that um, well, going in, we knew that uh, this group had 57 million followers on YouTube. And uh, that sort of got my attention. And, uh, uh, you know the the uh, results of the of the video have been great. I think you know the last time I saw, and I'm sure it's gone more than that. There had been five five thousand five million views rather, and it was trending as the number one uh, YouTube video at the time. So I, I think it I think it uh, it accomplished what we wanted to. Uh, I know I've heard I've heard from a number of my law partners who have. You know, teenage children who said, "This is great. They, my kids want to go out and play golf." So uh, that's sort of the idea. We'll, we'll we'll look at more more things like that, but you know, always through a lens of our culture and respect for the game, respect for the institution in this place.